It's Sunday, June 2, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. Our guest today is a former teacher who was elected to the Texas House of Representatives in 2018 for the Democrats. In 2022, he won again in District 50 and sits on the Public Education Committee, Calendars Committee and Juvenile Justice and Family Issues Committee. Representative James Tallarico, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thanks for having me. So you, um, you've you had a lot of success on social media recently, uh, going viral with a lot of your, um, the, the, the energy and the passion with which you speak. And I found it absolutely fascinating. I'm thrilled that we have the chance to actually talk to you here, as opposed to me just liking you and, and retweeting you. Um, I, wanted, I want us to talk about the rise of, of Christian nationalism in, in the US and certainly in Texas and um, the MAGA leadership that doesn't appear to believe in the separation of church and state. You're a person of faith, uh, a devout Christian, and yet you are one of the loudest dissenting voices regarding the teaching of Bible studies in school. Just explain that to people who might not quite get it. Yeah, you know, I think it's helpful to define terms here because I know Christian nationalism is, is a new term that maybe we're not all familiar with. So the way I define it, is that Christian nationalism is the worship of power, political power, social power, economic power in the name of Christ. And in my reading of the Gospels, it is a betrayal of Jesus of Nazareth. And so I, as a Christian, feel that I have a moral obligation to speak out against this perversion of my faith and this subversion of our democracy. Christian nationalism has permeated the Republican Party to the point that, as we know, the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, he is, you know, very much doesn't believe in the separation of church and state, has said that out loud. He says, if you want to know my views, just read, read the Bible. And, and, and also in Texas, I should just mention there was this three day conference, uh, this convention uh, where delegates there move the needle even further to the right, preaching. Christian nationalism and uh, approving rules that would give them unprecedented control of, of elections. I mean, the, the Republicans aren't hiding this, are they? And, and we know about Project 2025, which maybe we'll get into later, which is a, also a Christian nationalist manifesto for reimagining the United States uh, government in, in Donald Trump's image. It, it's, it's kind of terrifying and dystopian. And yet, I don't think people quite get that difference between what a, you know, a, a Christian a practicing moderate Christian such as yourself is and, and the definition of, of a nationalist. Yeah, you know, my granddad was a Baptist preacher in South Texas. I've been going to the same church uh, since I was two years old, same church where I was baptized. Uh, I'm now a student at Austin seminary, learning to become a minister myself one day. My faith underpins everything that I do. It's the reason I, I taught public school on the west side of San Antonio. It's the reason I, I led an education nonprofit. And it's the reason I ran for office and why I, I work on education, health care, and economic issues at the state capitol. So, so my faith is the most important thing in my life. And I try to tell folks that there is nothing Christian about Christian nationalism. It is a perversion of my faith. Um, and, and all of these attempts to grab political power and wield it to hurt others, particularly those who are at the margins, those who are different, uh, those who are oppressed, it's the exact opposite of what Jesus taught us to do in the New Testament. And so I think it's incumbent upon people of faith, particularly Christians uh, who hold elected office, to speak out against uh, this, uh, this attempt to use Christianity to hurt our neighbors. And I suppose in schools, that is how you indoctrinate. And you make a very good case, as you, as you have done in the, in the House several times, talking about the, the difference between indoctrination of the Christian faith by teaching Bible studies 
versus the indoctrination of, say, LGBTQ plus issues. Just explain that argument because it's it's compelling. Yeah, you know, we've heard this this catchphrase from people like Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz that schools are for education and not indoctrination, which I completely agree with. And I imagine most of your viewers agree with that statement. The problem is they use that catchphrase to go after any kind of inclusion of gay kids in our schools, um, any kind of inclusion of kids of color or books with characters of color or gay characters. And they're doing that at the same time that they're actually pushing indoctrination into our schools. There was a bill to force every teacher in Texas to display the Ten Commandments on their classroom walls. There was a bill to replace school counselors with untrained, unsupervised religious chaplains. And there was a bill to use public school dollars to fund private Christian schools. And and I'm sure we're going to talk about this, but there was breaking news yesterday that there is new curriculum for language arts classrooms in the state of Texas that is that is pushing Bible stories in a public school context. And so that is actual literal religious indoctrination. And so all I'm asking is that Republican politicians live up to their own standard and make sure that schools are for education and not indoctrination. So we're looking at the story of Queen Esther, who convinced her husband, the Persian king, to spare the Jews to the depiction of Christ's Last Supper. It's materials designed to draw connections between classroom content and, and religious texts. And, and this could potentially reach more than 2 million K-5 students in, in Texas, which is the nation's second largest state. I mean, this is not by accident, is it, James? I mean, they're, they're doing this because they're seeking to create a kind of Christian nationalist army going forward. And any of the reading that anybody cares to do will discover that in the same way that, that the Trump people are training thousands of, of, of these same Trump loyalists to work in the federal government. That's right. They're they're seeking to build a Christian nationalist theocracy right here in the United States of America. And just like the the Taliban uh, or Al Qaeda is a perversion of Islam in pursuit of political and social power, the same is true of these Christian nationalists that are trying to destroy our democracy and undermine our constitution. And so the, the curriculum that was just released uh, yesterday should disturb all of us, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your uh, religious affiliation. It's a direct assault on our American democracy and our American constitution. And what about the argument that some of them say, including Mike Johnson, that the founding fathers, they actually wrote these papers with religion in mind? And that actually, you know, these were religious people and it, it was all about religion. And, and for us to now say that there should be a ch- separation of church and state goes against their interpretation of the Constitution. I mean, it's, it's historically inaccurate, to say the least. Um, some of our founding fathers were religious, but many of them weren't religious at all. Um, yeah. Many of them were deists, which yes. I think, you know, mo- modern day Christians would quibble with that kind of theology. It flies in the face of of Christian doctrine. Um, So we should be clear eyed about who the founding fathers were religiously. Again, I'm a big fan of our founding fathers and our founding documents, and I'm not casting aspersions, but when we try to make them out to be evangelical Christians, we're, we are, uh, we're pushing fairy tales and not history. Um, The other thing is that we should look at what our founding fathers put in the bill of rights. If we want to see what their vision for our democracy was, And the First Amendment, the very first amendment to that Bill of Rights includes the Establishment Clause, which prohibits the United States government from establishing a state religion. And that's exactly what this new curriculum in the state of Texas is seeking to do. I want to be very clear. I actually don't have a problem with exposing our students to the great faith traditions of the world. I think that's important for them to learn, to understand both so that they can can read literature and understand allusions in literature, for them to understand um, social and historical 
uh, trends throughout history, but also for their own uh, spiritual, religious curiosity. Uh, school should spark your imagination to pursue your own interests and your own passions and develop your own beliefs. That's what true education does. Indoctrination seeks to impose one selected worldview on our students by force. That's the difference between education and indoctrination. And when you look at this new curriculum, it is elevating Christianity over the other great faith traditions across the world. It is essentially silencing the religious views of the majority of people across the globe in favor of one uh, interpretation of Christianity. So not only is this un-American, not only is this unconstitutional, but as I mentioned earlier, it's deeply unchristian because Jesus's concern was always for those at the margin, those who were different, those who were, were outcasts and, and pushed aside. And I, as a former teacher, as a Christian, I am concerned with the impact of this kind of indoctrination on our Hindu students, on our Buddhist students, on our Muslim students, on our Jewish students, uh, and on our atheist students who don't, who don't have a particular religious tradition at all. As a Christian, I am called to have special concern for those students who are marginalized, who are different, who are bullied. And this curriculum is, is not loving those students, not loving those neighbors. And that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus asked us to do. Let's talk about religion or all faiths, really, because they're all very similar, you know, aside from the end goal or who the God might be or whatever, the in their foundation, religion as I see it, and I'm not a person of faith, but I, you know, I was brought up in, you know, I went to Christian schools and I was also forced to have a bar mitzvah, which is not <laughs> something I ever wanted either. So cool. I've really had a, a great exposure to, to multiple faiths. And I recognize that the theme is to, you mentioned love thy neighbor, but very much to look out for the poor and to support the poor and to welcome the poor and offer sanctuary to the poor. And yet poor is not a word I ever hear in American news or coverage or even in, in, in Congress. People talk about the middle classes all the time, but there is this kind of blindness to the working poor who m most Americans are pretty much in that category of, of, of the working, working poor. And, you know, with, with credit card debts, and obviously there's no free healthcare here unless you're in a very small category. I mean, it's very interesting to me that, that the poor has been effectively whitewashed from, from society. Just talk to that for me and, and maybe kind of work backwards from there. Yeah, I, I, I also think it's uh, amusing uh, and terrifying that Christian nationalists want to base our laws on the Bible until they read the words of Jesus, right? Welcome the stranger, liberate the poor, release the prisoners, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, right? That, those, kind of, uh, those kind of commandments from Jesus never seem to make it into our public policy discussions. Uh, and once you read the New Testament, you realize that uh, some Republican politicians in the United States are going to be pretty unhappy living in a truly Christian nation because it would mean that we would have special concern for the sick and the poor and the outcast and the stranger. And, and that's exactly the opposite of what we see in, in the Republican platform. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you that there, there is a, a, a strong current of social justice and economic justice through, through the entire Bible, both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And it was central to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And it always seems to be absent from any talk of making this a Christian nation or bringing Christian values to our public conversation. It's very selective, isn't it? Which <laughs> bits apply and which bits don't apply? Because well, at the heart of it, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and, and I, I would, you know, the things that they, that they push uh, as Christian nationalists actually don't appear in the Bible at all, right? right. The Bible doesn't talk yeah. about abortion. And in fact, yeah. the few pieces of scripture that maybe could be interpreted as referring to abortion or, um, or to the personhood of a fetus tend to be on the pro-choice side um, uh, uh, of the argument. 
There's also no mention of gay marriage in the Bible. There's no mention of consensual, um, loving, monogamous, same-sex relationships. So it, it just blows my mind that Christian nationalists zero in on abortion and gay rights when both of those things don't appear in the Bible. And the scriptures that we do have tend to lead us to believe in in women's rights and in universal gay rights. Uh, and so it's not just picking and choosing. They're actually uh, lying about what's in scripture and they are um, they are distorting our religious faith for their own extreme right wing political agendas. So let's dig a little deeper into that. Why is that? Why use the Bible as an excuse and, and religion as an excuse to effectively control people? Because as I see abortion, abortion is about control, isn't it? It's right. men controlling women. That's right. And, and it's the same with, you know, people's views on, on homosexuality, which has been around since, since time began. And they talk about transgenderism, even like it's a new thing. Right. It's. It, I find it, as a European coming here, I find it very frustrating that these, you know, that there's always a new victim, well, yeah. you know, and, and and the current victim is sadly the the, the transgender person. But yeah. let, let's just talk about why they want this 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 very narrow kind of binary view of America, where if you're not white, male, and Christian, and a Trump supporter, you don't really get to share in, in a kind of the society in an equal measure? You know, I think we have to look back at the history of Christianity. And so if you'll indulge me for a minute, yeah. I'll, I'll give a little Sunday school lesson. So <laughs> the, the, the first followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves the way because their crucified teacher had taught them a different way of, of being human. And so the first um, the first followers of Christ were a peculiar people. That's how the, the the Bible describes them. They shared all of their possessions. They refused to participate in in the economy of the Roman Empire. They refused to serve in the military. They refused to to engage in the culture, and they were persecuted for for that peculiarity. Um, but three hundred years after the Roman Empire crucified Jesus on a Roman cross. Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official state religion of that very same empire. And ever since, the powers that be have been um, diluting Christianity into something more palatable, right? Pro-war, pro-wealth, pro-white supremacy. And so it's it's continued from Constantine all the way to Donald Trump. Uh, those that are in power, those at the top, whether it's politicians, whether it's emperors, whether it's billionaires, they they want to tame this wild religion that leads to radical universal human love because it's a threat to their own power. And so this is a this is not a new phenomenon. Constantine was the first Christian nationalist. And we've seen them pop up in different iterations throughout history. I'll remind your viewers that uh, Nazi soldiers had written within their uniforms the phrase, God is with us. Um, uh, uh, the Ku Klux Klan um, uh, had, had rallies with signs that says, Jesus saves. And, and when you saw the insurrection on January 6th, many of those rioters who were beating and attacking police officers were carrying crosses and Christian flags. So this is not a new story. This is something that the religion of Jesus has had to contend with. Those that are in power trying to use our faith to further their own political ends. So it, it, in a way, the, the hypocrisy is that it's, a, it's an excuse for, these, for, for, for riotous behavior and also control. Right. This as we've discovered in the last week, has now gone all the way to the Supreme Court. Were you surprised, because we've just heard that Justice Samuel Alito will not recruit, recuse himself from any of, the, uh, any, any of the investigations into Donald Trump and immunity and January 6th and all, all of that stuff, despite the fact that he flew a, a, a flag 
upside down at his own home. And now we're hearing about other flags. And we're also now reading that he's written in previous dissents that the flag is something that is important, even though he now claims that he doesn't care for flags. I mean, the whole thing is just garbage and embarrassing. And so what hope is there for society writing itself when the Supreme Court is in disarray on these subjects, as well as the Republican presidential candidate? who, you know, is recently just out of court for paying off an adult entertainment star so that he could win the election. Right. The same the same presidential candidate who is peddling his own Trump branded Bibles. Um, right. You know, with, I, with certain aspects removed, of course, there's a, there's a course. there's a few chapters missing and it's not a great product as we've heard it being right. reviewed recently. Right. Yes. And, and, and I believe the Trump Bibles also have a, a copy of the United States Constitution. So it's, right. it's, um, it's amusing that it's, it's two documents, the Bible and the Constitution. Yeah. That, and the Bill of Rights is in there as that's well. That's right. Yeah, all documents that Donald Trump has never read. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I think these are dark times in the United States and across the world. Um, we are seeing religious supremacy on the rise in lots of areas uh, of the globe, uh, not just the United States and not just within Christianity. There are those in political power who are seeking to use religion to further their own ambitions and to control their, their, their populations. And you saw that on the U.S. Supreme Court when Christian nationalist justices decided to overturn Roe v. Wade, and it allowed states like mine here in Texas to outlaw abortion, even in cases of rape, incest, and threats to the mother's health. Because of that, um, that decision by the Supreme Court and that decision by Texas Republicans, 26,000 Texas women have been forced to give birth to their rapist baby. Infant maternal mortality, both are on the rise since those decisions. Women in Texas are being told to wait in emergency room parking lots until they go into sepsis. You, you've probably, Anthony, heard the story of Kate Cox, uh, a pregnant woman in Dallas, Texas. She and her husband desperately wanted a baby, uh, but they found out that the fetus had a, a lethal abnormality. And after four trips to the emergency room, Kate's doctors told her that she needed an abortion to save her life and her future fertility. But Texas Republicans forced her to continue with the life-threatening pregnancy that her doctors had advised her to terminate. Luckily, Kate was able to flee to another state and get the health care that she needed to save her life. But many Texas women don't have that option. And so this is it's very important for your viewers to understand that this has never been about life. This has always been about controlling women. Now there are some Texas counties that are blocking women from using public highways to travel out of state to get an abortion. Donald Trump just told Time Magazine that he's going to let red states monitor women's pregnancies. And the Republican Party here in Texas just came out with their new platform, and it advocates for the death penalty for those who, who seek abortion care. So Republican extremism and Christian nationalism are literally killing women in the state of Texas. And I, I want to emphasize how unchristian this is because Christianity is a feminist religion. Jesus had female followers, which was unusual in the first century. And for those that know their New Testament, the female followers of Jesus were the first to witness the resurrection and the first to preach the gospel of the resurrection. They were the, the, the first at the cradle and the last at the grave. And Jesus broke first century norms by speaking with women, by trusting women. The longest conversation Jesus has with anybody in the entire Bible is with the Samaritan woman at the well. The only person to change Jesus's mind about anything, the only person to teach him something new was the Syrophoenician woman. So there is a long history in my religion of respecting the full uh, personhood and the full humanity of women. And those Christian nationalists on the Supreme Court, those Christian nationalists around Donald Trump who are seeking to control women, they are, they are doing a grave disservice to our faith tradition. 
And yet, a lot of these representatives who also fear Muslims, for example, Donald Trump executed a Muslim ban, which is blew my mind. That was like the first week of his presidency. Promises yeah. to do it again, of course. They they make people fear Muslims because there's like they'll bring Sharia law. And yet <laughs> you know yeah. where I'm going with this, don't you? Okay. And, and 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 yet the very laws that they're trying to get onto statute and have been successful with are uh, are uh, make Sharia law look like some kind of you know moderation in comparison. Yeah, this is Christian Sharia law. This is the Christian Taliban. If if your viewers haven't already, they need to read and do their own research about Project 2025, which is essentially the manifesto that lays out what a second Trump administration would look like. And I will tell you, the man that is rumored to be chief of staff in a second Trump administration is a self-proclaimed Christian nationalist. Yes. And so the, the policies that I'm talking about here in Texas they're about to go nationwide if Trump wins a second term. They're going to ban abortion nationwide. They're going to ban IVF, which Alabama has has already tried to do. They're going to ban contraception. They're going to ban pornography. They've even talked about banning what they call recreational sex. Yeah. So th this is not hypothetical. We saw it with abortion. We are living with the consequences of that Supreme Court decision here in my state. Women are dying as we speak because of that decision by Donald Trump's Supreme Court justices. So we're not playing around. Th this is happening and it is about to go nationwide if Donald Trump gets anywhere near the White House uh, in, in November. What's so blind about it though, James, is that Republican women need abortions too. That's right. And 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 so what this does is it's almost like this is why it's dystopian, because, you know, people are by nature of their indoctrination are voting against their own needs and interests. And and it, it's frightening because America, you know, Americans love to say it's the greatest country in the world. And, and I choose to live in it. Right. And I have a choice of where I could live. And I, I choose the U.S. and I continue to choose the U.S. but it's it's like on so many issues stuff happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world and this concept of control it is is really the one that makes me the most nervous because it's minority groups that are suffering it's women who don't have a voice or a platform because m men won't allow for it how do you qualify that in your mind as as a good christian seeing your own religion being used, it, 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 being weaponized effectively to, to actually brainwash people and to create a society where people do not have the opportunity to fight back. You know, it breaks my heart to see how people are perverting my faith. It also breaks my heart to see how people are perverting my country. You know, I, I do believe that the United States is the greatest country in the world because America is an aspiration. It's a project. It's an experiment. The idea of a true multiracial, multicultural, multireligious democracy, it's something that's never really existed in human history. And we're trying to build it right here in the United States. We're not always successful. Uh, you can look throughout our history and see how we have fallen short of that promise. But the aspiration of America still lives in people's hearts, including mine. And so I refuse to let Christian nationalists take over my religion and take over my country. And that's why I choose to use my platform to speak out uh, against this, this attempt to destroy my religion and my country, which both mean more to me than anything. It's so interesting to me. You're the second person recently who said to me that the, the U.S. is this experiment and it's never been done before. And we're bringing together religions and faiths and cultures and nationalities and everything. And, and I say, as somebody who obviously grew up in the U.K. and traveled around Europe, as a lot of British people do, that that is completely untrue. It is completely normal for nations to be of multi-faith and multi-race and multi-culture. And it's imperfect but it is normal. And I do think that 
this is an argument, and I'm not trying to call you out because I think this is a, a, a thing, an issue of um, maybe American exceptionalism or something that's baked into the culture. <laughs> and I first discovered that when I when I heard, I think, Kevin McCarthy say, you know, we won the Second World War for the Europeans. And I was like, they didn't teach us that in Europe, a very different, very different version of history. Yeah. But my point is that, that it is perfectly normal in most civilized countries, westernized or otherwise, for multi-faith and multi-racial, multinational people to live and be integrated and to, and in some countries they tolerate, you know, that's a word we have in England is, you know, it's a very tolerant society. I don't particularly like that word because I prefer integration, but we you know, most countries, it, it is normal. And yet here, for some reason, people uh, are like, you know, this is a special thing that we're doing here. And it's, and I just wish that America would recognize that the rest of the world has been doing this stuff for years and has, and has got on with it. And it's kind of going quite well because we seem to be going backwards here in the U S. Yeah, a couple of things. And I don't want to get into a uh, British American rivalry here. No, no, no. None uh, of that. None of that. We settled that in 1776. But, you know, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud that the American experiment has spread across the globe, right? Because when we started that experiment, y'all were still being run by a, a king appointed by God. And so I, I, I think what, what I want to see is that experiment, both in America, but now that it's spread throughout many countries in the world, I mean, India. Is, is the world's largest democracy, right? So this is no longer exclusively an American experiment. Uh, right. It just happened to start here. What I'm, what I'm saying though, is that all of our countries, all of these democracies are still not the, the fruition of that experiment, the fruition of that dream, right? As, if we still have folks living in poverty in our two countries, if we still have folks who struggle with access to the ballot box, uh, if we still don't have true representation for every ethnic group, then we haven't lived up to the promise of democracy. And of course, some countries are farther along than others. And sadly, here in America, where that experiment started, we are backsliding. Um, and, and that troubles me greatly. But all of us still have so much more work to do to create a true democracy. Um, but, but you're right. You know, the, we should look as Americans uh, to other countries, uh, especially in Western Europe, uh, for inspiration about about how to continue with this experiment and ultimately reach that goal of a true democracy of a beloved community or as as i would describe it as a christian the kingdom of god where every single person counts where every single person has a seat at the table i suppose the point i'm making and now we're, we're basically singing off the same hymn sheet yeah. is the is the trajectory and and for me, the trajectory has to keep going in a more inclusive and progressive direction. That's right. And other nations have managed to achieve that. And us and the graph still looks like this. The US, and I think Roe was a very good moment to talk about how that dropped off and, and how the US is winding itself back. Because a lot of MAGA Republicans in as lawmakers and and, and as voters yeah. What they want is a kind of maybe a picket fence 1950s version of America where the white man was supreme and, you know, women didn't work and black people were in their own neighborhoods and then never crossed into their district. I mean, that's, as I see it, what, what's happening now. That's right. And, and I do believe um, that we are seeing some of this backsliding around the world um, in some of the countries we just mentioned, um, you know, especially with. Um, tensions around immigration and demographic change and, and those who want to, to pull us apart rather than bring us closer together, right? And I know y'all in, in Europe have tried with the European Union to bring us closer together, and, and there are forces trying to tear that apart. The same is true in the United States. And so we have to make a decision as, as those uh, who love democracy, whether it's here or abroad, whether we're going we're gonna to try to bring folks closer together whether we're going to try to continue down this this road of creating a, a true democracy, or whether we're going to go backwards, uh, whether we're going to see our neighbors as our enemies, um, and and to me, uh, we either have um, we have two choices in front of us, as as Dr. King once said, we have nonviolent coexistence, or we have violent co annihilation, because the challenges that we face, whether it's poverty, whether it's climate change. These things are existential, 
and and it's going to take all of us coming together to solve them and and save uh, democracy and this planet for future generations. So, um, yeah, I, I think the stakes could not be higher for this decision that we all face. We have to take a quick break, but I, I want to come back and talk about the existential crisis that you mentioned, uh, not just of climate change, but also of the vote in November. Uh, that's to come next here on The Weekend Show. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention. And Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner Altogether, I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony. Anthony and use code Anthony A N T H O N Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive and it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work and family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. I myself had a whitening procedure in the dentist's chair several years ago. It was kind of painful, I didn't really enjoy it, and it didn't seem to last. Well, 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves and crannies to get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips or trays or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery, plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. We're back with Texas State Representative James Tallarico here on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, the election in November, some are saying, if not hopefully most people, this is the most important election in American political history. Why do you think, just tell us why you believe the stakes are so high and why this election maybe differs to, to previous general elections? Yeah, you know, we normally have uh, elections with ideological differences. You know, what should the tax rate be for the richest folks in this country? How much should we spend on services for working class people? Um, those are those are typical debates within the parameters of our democracy. But that's not the debate happening in 2024. The debate happening in 2024 is whether we're going to continue that debate at all. It's, it's whether we're going to have any more elections after this one. 
And the reason I say that is because Donald Trump showed us in his first term that he is not willing to honor the peaceful transfer of power, which underpins this entire democratic experiment. If we cannot honor the results of elections, if we cannot transfer power after the results of those elections, then we don't have a democracy at all. And Donald Trump has shown us that he's not willing to leave. He's already promised that he's going to be a dictator on day one. Uh, and he's he's already entertained the idea of a third or fourth Trump term. Uh, and so the stakes for this election are so high because we are having a conversation about whether to continue uh, this democracy of ours. And, and that's why people of all political backgrounds, of all ideological bents need to be engaged in saving the American experiment so that we can keep having these debates between progressives and conservatives, um, between um, you know, those, those who are liberal and, and those who tend to be more libertarian. Those are good, healthy debates to have, but we can't have them without the democratic system that allows for that free exchange of ideas. I don't really see much debate happening anywhere, to be honest. I mean, we call it debate, don't we? But, you know, debate as I know it is, as you and I are doing right now, having a a conversation, even though we have different views. And for me, as a as a person who who does not subscribe to a, a, a faith or a belief system, I'm able to converse and listen to you who clearly does. That is quite a rare thing for, for American political discourse these days. Why, why are people so desperate to compartmentalize? Because I believe we're all the same, fundamentally. Yeah. Sure, you can have a different belief system, but ultimately we all want the same things and hopefully we all you know, care about the same stuff. And, and yet somebody, somebody said to me that like, re- Republicans now are just Democrats who came into money. <laughs> I don't know if there's any truth to that. But yeah. I, I do believe that, you know, following the money and, and, and wealth and equating success with wealth and all of that stuff has really led a lot of people astray. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny, Anthony, you, you say that you're not a person of faith, but the idea that we are all the same inherently is a deeply spiritual idea. Um, and I think probably what you mean is you don't belong to a one of the, the major organized religions, which I... I respect and I understand why, too, given all the harm that organized religion has done to people around the world. I tend to see, though, that everyone has a faith of some kind. Um, Everyone believes in something. Um, A lot of people believe in money. A lot of people believe in power. A lot of people believe in status. And then there are those of us who believe in something else, something like equality, uh, something like love and compassion and kindness. And whether you call that Christian or Buddhist or or humanist, it is still a, a common thread that unites so many of the wisdom traditions around the world. And it's one we need to return to. Um, I may use different language as a Christian. You know, I may say that we're all created in the image of God, but that's that's just a difference in poetry, right? We're saying the same thing, that every person, regardless of your race, your gender, your culture, your religion, we all are entitled to unconditional love and respect. We, we, are, all, um, we are all of infinite worth. Um, and, and so that's, that's an idea that is, that is fundamental to the American experiment, right? Uh, the idea that all people are created equal. And we have to return to those roots if we're gonna find our way out of this, this current darkness. I often think that fear is at the heart of a lot of this. We talked about the fear of a Sharia law earlier, but there is the fear of the the changing demographic from yeah. from Republicans. They are they are scared of, of people who don't look like them getting any power, taking over. I wasn't living here during Barack Obama's presidency, but I can only imagine it caused a, a, a lot of, a lot of concern for a, for a certain group. Right. Which is so weird to me because, you know, we had a female prime minister in England in 1979, for example. That hasn't happened here yet either. So we, I, I just get a sense that, that a lot of this comes down to racism. And we talked about, you know, that, that wealth divide and not talking about poverty um, or even relative poverty, which is how most people live, especially in Texas. And yet 
people think of Texas as being, you know, wealthy and oil and all of the, you know, all of those um, kind of very obvious things that we maybe see in the movies. But the reality is people are pretty desperate and, and they are, and you, you know, you mentioned how, how women are, are dying in Texas because of Republican legislation. Is it that people just don't want to talk about this stuff because it's too much to cope with spiritually or emotionally or, or, you know, I sometimes think that these doomsday conversations, because things have got so bad, people would much rather just Netflix and chill and not even engage on these types of doomsday topics. Yeah. So one, I, I think we should recognize that that is a, that's an, a, an inherent human instinct to be loyal to your group. Right, um, we are we are social mammals. Um, it's sometimes hard to forget that we're we're mammals. Uh, yeah. but, we, but we are. It's the tribe. And, it's it's tribalism. That's right. That's right. Um, and that is deeply ingrained in our biology. What we're trying to do with this this experiment in democracy around the world is is rise above those animal instincts and to see that you know you may live across the Atlantic Ocean, but we have the same dreams for ourselves and our families and our neighborhoods. Um, that, that is a challenge. And it's something that we're all struggling with. It's, sometimes it's easy to kind of point across the aisle and say they have a particular problem, but we all, we all struggle with that. Some of us are a little farther along than others, but it is something we're all trying to overcome. And it's something that the great faith traditions of the world and the great teachers of humanity, whether it's Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad or Moses, are trying to help us overcome um, and see what we all have in common. In my experience, I've, I've been doing um, politics for three terms now. I first ran in 2018. And I've come to believe that politics is, is not really left versus right. It's actually top versus bottom, which you kind of just alluded to. So many of the divisions in our country, in my state, are manufactured Wealthy special interests, the people at the top, want us to think that politics is left versus right so that we're busy fighting each other instead of focusing on the problem, which is the fact that they have hoarded power and wealth for themselves at our expense. And so there are folks, there are two billionaire mega donors here in Texas, Tim Dunn and Ferris Wilkes. I hope your viewers will, will, will read about them. But they are essentially trying to divide Texans by race divide us by culture, divide us by religion, by gender, to keep us from seeing all that we have in common, to keep us from realizing that there is far more that unites us than divides us. Because once we do that, once we see that in one another, we're going to come together, right? We're going to come together across race, across culture, across religion, across gender, and we're going to take power back for ourselves and our families and our communities. And that is a threat to the powers that be to the folks who really control this country. And so I, I think we've got to try to do our best to break past some of these, these false divisions. Um, because in my experience, I have a hot take that most people deep down are pretty good. And, and I know that's, uh, that's probably- yeah, I, believe that, I believe that too. I believe yeah. that we're born, we're born good, yeah. certainly. We are, yeah. and, and I, I see that every day, you know, as a politician, I've got to run for office, which means I knock on people's doors, right? I, I got to go out in my district and I've got to knock directly and talk to them face to face. So it, it, it forces me to get past the social media algorithms and the cable news networks. And it forces me to talk to people, human to human, face to face. And I have to tell you, most people in my district, whether they're Democrat, independent or Republican, they actually have pretty good moral instincts. Most people believe that racism is wrong, even though we all struggle with racist ideas that we've grown up with, but most of us have an aspiration to get beyond it. And that's a remarkable thing, right? That, that we all believe in fairness and respect and human dignity. But what's happening is that those people at the top, the people who control the social media algorithms, the people who, who benefit from cable news networks, they wanna keep us angry and distracted and divided because it, it pays. And, and they're doing it while they're robbing us all blind. Yeah. And so I think our challenge, Anthony, you as a, as, as, a, as a journalist, me as an elected official, our job is to try to resist that and, and bring people together. 
because that's the only way forward. Dividing folks, that's their game. That's Donald Trump's game. That can't be us. We're, we, we don't win with that strategy. Um, and, and we have to do something completely different, which is how do we honor that shared humanity and, and find those common values? I agree. I try now to talk less about how polarized this country is and divided this country is because I don't believe that it is. I believe that certain media networks want to tell you that it is. That's and right. I believe that certain lawmakers want to tell you that it is. But as, as you say, humanity kind of wins out. And that our our shared uh, beliefs are, are more similar than our, our differences. These are starting to sound like Obama speeches. Here. I don't, I don't well, have a problem and, with either. And you see it, you know, you see it best when there's a disaster, right? Yeah. I'm sure you've seen this in in your country. Certainly, I've seen it here. I've seen it in Texas. When the worst strikes, a tornado, a hurricane, a blackout, people come together and they help their neighbors, regardless of their race or their their culture or their religion. And to me, that that shows us who we truly are, right? When you get past the algorithms and the cable news networks. And so we, you and I, and, and those who care about democracy, we have got to appeal to those better angels, because that's the only path forward for the democratic experiment. But that does not apply when it comes to things like mass shootings and school shootings. There, there is a difference where, and you've made videos about thoughts and prayers as a, as a, as a yeah. concept. I mean, this is a problem where there is division, the, the, this kind of second amendment movement where the, the guns are more important than the lives of people or children. And, and I, I struggle with how to overcome that one personally. I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit because I actually think the, the mass shootings and the gun safety debate are perfect examples of my thesis. Because when you look at, at polling here in Texas, the vast majority of Texans, Republicans, independents, and Democrats support common sense gun safety measures. They support red flag laws. They support universal background checks. They support uh, banning assault weapons. And, and so the fact that we can't come together on those shared beliefs and enact policies that could keep our kids safe is because of the wealthy special interests who are controlling the gun debate, particularly the NRA. And those are the groups that fund the politicians and, and have them in their back pocket. And that's what's blocking us from acting on our common values, because even gun owners in my district believe in gun safety. Right. I, I've, I've met with gun owners in my district and and talked about where we agree on some of these needed reforms. So the fact that the political system is not responding to that shared public belief is a problem with the system itself. And the problem in our system in the United States is big money in our politics. It is the root of all of these problems in our system. It's the rot at the core of our broken politics. And so I actually think the, the gun issue is proof that politics is much more top versus bottom than it is left versus right, because I think there is lots of agreement uh, among the people of Texas, not the politicians and not the donors, but the people about the need to enact gun safety and protect our kids while still honoring a Second Amendment right to bear arms, because those are not mutually exclusive. You can do both of those things. In fact, we've done it in this country before, and we saw mass shootings decrease dramatically. So uh, I, I actually think that, that that is proof that it's the, the people at the top who are keeping us divided and blocking progress that most Americans want to see. And you can apply that thinking, actually, to most of the kind of hot button issues. Yeah. Abortion, for example, whenever the country is polled on, on a national level, most people are in support of health care for the mother. And That's again, right. it's just the lawmakers and the lobbyists and the extremists that are one, the ones that are framing the, the argument. Right. And and it's the same with with healthcare as well, you know, and and, and Medicare and Medicaid and, and social security. And it, and it's you know, big money is the key. But I also want to talk about some of these other systems. So, for instance, here in Texas, we just had our our primary elections, and in Texas, politicians draw their own lines for their districts. Um, you, you're familiar with gerrymandering. I'm sure your dis your viewers are familiar unfortunately, with well. yeah, right, but. And I was actually a victim of gerrymandering. The district that I won right. in 
in twenty eighteen. That was fifty. That was District fifty two, and you moved to That's fifty right. because of the re, the right. redistricting. Yeah. So I I I won my first race in twenty eighteen. I was actually running in a Trump district. Um, the district that I won had voted for President Trump just two years before I won. So a lot of those Trump voters supported me in, in that race. It was a 50-50 swing district. And that was great because it forced me as a politician to appeal to a lot of different kinds of people to win re-election, right? I couldn't just win with progressive Democrats. I, I had to win with Democrats, independents, and Republicans, which is good for democracy and good for policy. And that district was destroyed because I asked too many hard questions in the legislature. And so they decided to try to target me. Thankfully, I was able to move to the district next door where I where I grew up and run for reelection there. Yeah. But that new district that I represent, it's now an 80 percent Democratic district. Joe Biden won with 76 percent of the vote in my district, which means that my only competition as, a, as an elected official in District 50 is from my left right in a primary because the district is so democratic that the general election outcome is predetermined for the most part. Now, it doesn't really matter what happens in a democratic district, but in a state like Texas, we should be looking at those Republican districts that are also 80% Republican, 80% Trump districts, which means the only competition for the Republican majority is from their right. It's from the few voters who show up for a Republican primary. Only about a million Texans out of 30 million vote in the Republican primary election. And they are the ones determining the policy outcomes and the political outcomes for the entire state. So it's it's these interlocking systems. It's big money, it's gerrymandering, and it's these primary elections, which are moving our politics into such a, an extreme, dangerous, and unproductive direction. While most Texans and most Americans agree on the big policy issues of the day. Let's talk about the postcards ahead of the uh, the primary. It was a, a mailer that Texas voters were receiving, which lists the sender as American, America First Conservatives Election Department and warned Republican primary voters that they were being watched and would be reported if they did not vote. The postcard said, we see you haven't voted yet. Your voting record is public. Your neighbors are watching and will know if you miss this critical runoff election and we will notify President Trump if you don't vote, you can't afford to have that on your record. What, what's happening in Texas, James? Yeah, you don't want to disappoint the dear leader. Um, right. <laughs> it's the Fuhrer. Right. right. Uh, and, and, you know, th- this is my, my problem, is, you know, re- Republicans claim to be the party of freedom, family, and faith. That's what you hear from Republican politicians like, Donald Trump and Greg Abbott, you can't be the party of freedom and rob women of the right to control their own bodies. You can't be the party of family and allow weapons of war in our neighborhoods and in our classrooms. And you can't be the party of faith and worship at the feet of Donald Trump. Yeah. And so in my, in my experience, the Republican politicians who run Texas, they're not the party of freedom, family, and faith. They're the party of bullies and bigots and billionaires. And until we free ourselves of of that dynamic in the Republican Party, we're not going to have a healthy democracy. And we need more than one political party that's healthy. Uh, You know, I'm a proud Democrat, but we should have more than just the Democratic Party. But right now in the United States, there is only one healthy functioning political party, and it's the one that I belong to. And, and we desperately need more uh, if we're going to save this experiment and, and move forward as a country. So, so let's talk about November and what, you know, how high the stakes are. You've said how important it is. Do you think people, especially in Texas, are making that connection about Republicans wanting to ban everything and yet claiming to be the party of freedom and Democrats wanting to bring people together and support people? Because the banning is, as you've just mentioned, from abortion, contraception, immigrants, asylum seekers, right? (laughs) Banning gay marriage, transgender people from sport, banning history classes in schools, banning any discussion of slavery or race or gender identity or reassignment surgery or even banning pronouns. And now we know about banning Muslims and even 
banning you from drinking water while you're in line waiting to vote. Right. That it, it is it is so blatant, but there is a problem of of brainwashing and the people being so you know, lifelong Republicans or lifelong conservatives or hereditary voting or so much. I'm interested in whether people who identify as conservative would be prepared to step into the other box and 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 put a, a check in in the in the Democrat candidates um uh box on the on the polling form. Do you think that people can make that leap? Because it's hard to get people to switch when they're they're life has been devoted or not even devoted where they've just got muscle memory for voting for conservatives. I do. And I think the proof is in election results here in Texas. So Mitt Romney won Texas by double digits in 2012, but Donald Trump won Texas in 2020 by only five points. Ted Cruz won his last race here in Texas by two and a half points. So Texas is the largest battleground state in the country. And and I know that Republicans have still won at the top of the ticket, but you have to pop the hood and and look a little deeper at the at the trend lines. And the trend lines are that the Republican Party has lost ground under this this Trump regime. And that means that conservative voters, and I mean small C conservative voters who actually believe in conserving our traditions conserving our institutions, conserving our environment, are crossing over to join the Democratic coalition. You know, I, I, I really don't like to, to apply the term conservative to Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz and Donald Trump because they are not conservative. No. They well, are they're barely Repu- Republicans either. They don't right. believe in the Republic as it stands. Right. And that's why I think regressives is a much more accurate term for this new iteration of the Republican Party, because the conservatives like Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, they are they are they bear no resemblance to the current leaders of the Republican Party. You know, there was a time when conservatives wanted to protect these traditions and institutions and protect our natural resources. And, and that is is now history. And so I think there are still conservative people, still conservative voters who are looking for a home. And I hope that that my fellow Democrats um, will be able to to open our our big tent to include them because we may not agree on every issue, uh, we may have different approaches to public policy, but we all believe in trying to protect the Constitution and protect this American experiment of ours and 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 keep moving toward a more perfect union. Uh, I, I think that's happening in Texas. I think the election results show that. Uh, but we've got to continue that in 2024. I, I, I hope you're right. I was going to say, I pray that you're right, but apparently <laughs> I don't pray. So uh, <laughs> that's okay. There, there, there it is. Um, <laughs> that, that I'm right. Yeah, oops. oops. <laughs> um, let's finally talk about climate change because I'm of the opinion that America has had to put climate change on the back burner, if you pardon the pun, because it, it's just too much for people to get their heads around when yeah. there are other issues that seem way more pressing. Uh, how anything can be more pressing than the destruction of the planet, I don't know. But still, there is a, a, a reality to this, and that is the rise of fascism, the rise of Trumpism, and this you know Christian nationalism and Project 2025 and everything that goes with it. That is a short-term thing that needs to be extinguished if people want to enjoy what they've got used to in the U.S. For the, you know, since, it, since it began. So how how do Americans even begin to kind of get their head around the idea that the planet is is burning and it's our fault, especially in Texas, where there's an awful lot of drilling going on, drill baby drill, as uh, as Trump says, uh, when there's all these other issues at hand? So I don't want to be the naive optimist uh, on the show, uh, but I, I actually will point to some good news here. For the first time, in in modern polling in Texas, a majority of Texans, again, from all political backgrounds, believe that climate change is real and that man-made climate change is destroying the planet. That is remarkable progress, uh, especially for a state that yeah. has, been, has, has been the epicenter of the oil and gas industry. Right. And that is because Texans have experienced the firsthand impacts of climate change. 
just in the past decade, Texans have seen um, historic droughts, uh, unprecedented heat waves, um, devastating wildfires, five 500 year floods, um, and the deadliest winter storm in our state's history, history, which killed 700 of our fellow Texans. And so Texans are seeing that climate change is here and that we need action. And so I think if, if it can happen in Texas, if we can build that bipartisan coalition to save the planet, if we can do it here, then there's hope for us doing it across the country and across the world. And, and so we've got to keep this issue on the front burner, pardon my pun, to make sure that that folks understand that this is no longer a theoretical possibility. It is no longer something in the distant future for our kids and grandkids to deal with. It is here and it is killing Texans and Americans by the thousands. And so I'm hopeful that that people will wake up and not only recognize the threat, but also recognize the tremendous possibilities if we fight climate change, right? Texas just became the, the nation's leader in wind and solar energy. Texas is now the, the capital of renewable energy in the United States, which I think will surprise some of your some of your viewers. There is money to be made in fighting climate change. There are new businesses. But that's the key, business. isn't it, James? That's, that's the key. True. There, there needs to be, in order for it to work in America, there that's needs right. to be profit available. And, and there is profit in, in right. green energy. And an exciting future, right? For yeah. everyone who grew up watching the Jetsons, that's the future that we can have if we get in the fight against climate change. If, if everybody wants to drive a Tesla, right? If everybody wants to save on their, on their energy costs at home, then you should be with us on, on getting into the global fight against climate change. The future, if we're able to beat climate change, is going to be more prosperous, it's going to be safer, and it's going to be more exciting for all of us. So we as environmentalists have, have got to be using a, an exciting and, and, and uh, promising vision instead of just doom and gloom and, and chastising people for how long their showers are. Uh, that, that, I think, is the direction we've got to move if we're going to build a coalition big enough to, to, to fight climate change uh, in the United States and across the world. It's, it's, it's compelling, isn't it? It's just fr frustrating when Trump's argument is that windmills give you cancer. Uh, I think he's talking about wind turbines, and I don't know where the rest came from. <laughs> but it's, it's, it is so frustrating that, that the, the conversation is still at the level of trying to convince people that climate change is man-made when the oil companies had this data back in the 1950s. That's right. That's right. Um, but, but changing public opinion is our first step. And, and I'm, I'm happy that we are moving in that, in that direction. Again, just proves the point you and I were, were making earlier, which is that there's a disconnect between the, the demagogues who are controlling the Republican Party and their deep-pocketed donors and the voters, the people uh, in places like Texas, because there is now broad agreement across political lines that climate change is here. And we've got to do something about it. So, so how do we tap into that to start making real progress? Um, part of it's going to be reforming our political system to make it easier for the public's will to be translated into public policy. Okay. We have to finish, but I could talk to you for hours about this because there's, there's so much to say, but I'm thrilled to have you on the show, State Representative James Tallarico. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the work you do and honored to be here. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. See more from me on the five minute news channel. And I'll be back with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.